Hello everyone, um, or I'm not sure if everyone will see this. Hello, uh, this is our first video blog. My name is Jonah, and I'm going to be discussing and defending uh, the theory of nativism. All right, so a, a brief history um, about this theory before nativism, actually. Um, there was two prevalent theories in the time, uh, it was around the 40s, I think, and these were uh, behaviorism and Im the imitation theories. And so behaviorism especially began to fall out around the 1950s. And, and this was when Noam Chomsky, and specifically because, um, or a huge factor of it, was because Noam Chomsky criticized this theory. He criticized uh, Skinner's verbal behavior. <clears throat> and so he criticized this theory of behaviorism um, and explained why, you know, through logical reasoning, why it couldn't actually apply to language development. And so, once again, so this, this nativism theory it hypothesizes that humans have an innate ability to acquire language. And this innate ability is known as LAD, or uh, the language acquisition device. So a main argument for this innateness hypothesis is the poverty of the stimulus argument. And so this argument suggests that, you know, the language that children are exposed to is essentially impoverished. And so this, this means that we don't get enough data and we don't get good enough data um, from people around us to account for how well and how fast we learn language or children specifically. Um, and so this suggests that language has these universal, universal excuse me, principles um, that don't need to be learned by children to learn the language. It's, it's already, it's as if we are pre-wired to do so. And so, of course, there's, spe there's specific grammar rules we'll have to acquire later, um, but essentially we, we as humans are pre-wired. So, before I continue, I should point out that um, this, this whole, the nativism and basically what I'm talking about isn't an argument that language acquisition um, is 100% innate. Um, because if this were the case, we would all acquire the same language. And um, if that weren't the case, we would, you know, if, we're, if we were acquiring different languages, um, that would be biologically predetermined. Um, and so this is just a, a simply an argument, well not simply, but it's an argument that humans are pre-wired with knowledge of universal grammar. And we do, I think as I just discussed, we do, you know, learn other rules as we grow up, but um, essentially nativism accounts for this rapid and complete acquisition of language in children and and you know from the class notes even we discussed that children uh, become you know competent language learners around five years old and so you know you're gonna have to add things to grammar um, you know like let's say irregulars if you uh, I think we had an example if you have you know if, if a, a, a child might say daddy goad I think what it what it was and you say if you knew English, no, daddy went. And so the past tense of to go is irregular and therefore a child might pick up on, oh, it's, you know, add an ED and that's the whole, the universal grammar rules, but there are irregulars. So it just, th this theory and there's evidence that shows that we do have this innate ability. Um, so let's see. So this theory can be used to explain, uh, I think I just dabbled into that, the systematic nature um, of acquisition across cultures, across across different environments, you know, essentially across different languages. Um, and that's because if language is truly innate, um, then children across cultures will learn relatively in the same manner, in the same stages. Uh, you know, there's exceptions, there's variation um, due to culture, but and due to the environment, but essentially in the same manner. Um, and so we, we see, also we see it accounts for these systematic errors uh, that children make. Like I was saying, children might say, um, and there's you know plenty of examples, but a, a good one that is seen is 
the um, application of you know past tense in irregular verbs because if you were to say that he went it would be the correct way but if you just knew that you added an ed as a child um, to make it past tense you would say daddy goad so I was doing some research on nativism and uh, I actually came across a, a cool article um, it's, it's a great article it's on the U of A library website um, and it's titled infant artificial language learning and uh, and language acquisition and it's done by psychologist Rebecca Gomez and Luann Gherkin who I believe both um, research and um, teach at the U of A. Uh, so anyway, this article discusses um, studies which raise important issues in regards to uh, if the learning mechanisms of language are general or specific. And it, you know, it gets more in depth. Uh, it's probably a poor summary. But anyway, <clears throat> I'm just going to dis discuss a couple of things. So in, in box two specifically, when you open the article, you see what I mean? Uh, they explain and they compare the nativist and the, the classic empiricist uh, views of language acquisition. And so when they discuss, um, you know, these two, when they discuss nativism, they obviously bring up the poverty of the stimulus argument. And they bring up a great example that actually relates back to my example, um, or the example I used, which was, I believe, from the, the lecture um, podcast, which was the irregulars. Um, and the, the order, or the, the structure, and um, yeah. So anyway, they, they first describe that it's assumed that a child never considers rules based off uh, linear order at first. And so an example they provide um, is that children don't remove, um, or don't move, excuse me, the first verb of a sentence to the front. And so that's basically saying, you know, um, children won't er erroneously, as they put it, change a statement such as the man who is tall is Sam into something ungrammatical, a uh, question such as is the man who is tall Sam? Um, and so given that children hear uh, these simple instances and, you know, which lead to the formation of these language rules, how would we explain um, certain cases where you know, or the lack of errors in certain cases where there's two verbs, and that would be, you know, in subordinate clauses. And so they bring this up um, to highlight the important factor that the classic answer to this, um, that is widely accepted, is to assume that children are innately determined uh, to consider, you know, structure dependence of syntactic phrases, syntactic phrases, um, you know, in an opposition to linear wording. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, the second article that I will be discussing is titled The Evolution of the Critical Period for Language Acquisition. And this is by James Herford, I believe, Herford. Uh, uh, and it, it, was, it was accepted in the middle of 1991. And I won't be analyzing the full article because I don't have time for that. Uh, but I will just be bringing up a, key, a couple key aspects that relate... Um, back to nativism. And so he basically, he brings up, a, this is what I'll bring up, he brings up um, a report by Johnson and Newport and they have their own experiment um, in which they studied attainment of Chinese and Korean learners uh, of English as a second language. And I know this um, study uh, discusses adult learning languages, however, uh, it highlights a key point. So the results basically suggest um, that and claim that the maturational state hypothesis um, is valid and that's being that uh, humans have the specific capacity for acquiring language in childhood and it, this is regardless of if it's their first or second language um, you know just consider bilingual or trilingual or multilingual children. Um, and so this suggests that there is a critical period in which we use our innate ability uh, to acquire languages. And because, I mean, for example, many people learn languages um, when they're old, uh, such as I do. I'm not considering myself old, but I've, I've learned Spanish. Um, but I didn't learn it at the rapid pace uh, that a native Spanish speaker would as a child. 
So to wrap things up, I'm going to be talking about uh, just real briefly testing the theory um, of nativism and essentially, you know, is there any evidence that could possibly um, or potentially support nativism or is there evidence um, or an experiment that could, you know, disprove nativism. And so if you wanted to make an argument, you can make an argument disproving that, um, you know, nativism is the only thing I can think about disproving it um, is that it's not a hundred percent. We don't, we aren't a hundred percent innate to learn languages. Um, and you know, that's not what I was um, arguing in the first place, but it's a good point to bring up. Um, and, and I think I discussed about a possible rebuttal um, or, or, you know, just an explanation for that would be if that were the case, all children would acquire the same language. So any, if I could think of an experiment or evidence to prove um, nativism fully, I would say that when you, when you put studies together that include uh, bilingual and trilingual children, uh, you can compare those and the learning rates um, compared to, you know, in their critical periods compared to adults like myself who take six years to learn Spanish and not even as well as a native speaker. So these are, you know, just potential tests to the theory and I hope you've enjoyed. Thank you.